So in front of me here now, we have some of the engine manufacturers that I think you're going to enjoy hearing from. On the right, if you'll raise your hand, Christian Mundigler, he's from Rotax. If you don't know Rotax, you haven't been paying attention. Next to him is, is it John Heitland? Heitland, okay, I think I've got that right. From Continental, and Continental now owns, I think is the correct term, the Titan engine line. So that's very exciting for us. Woo! Directly in front of me is uh, Pete Karate from Jabiru Engines. Robert Helm from UL Power. Jan Eggenfeller from Viking Engines and addressing the electric component of propulsion to come anyway. Willie Taki from Flying Pages Magazine. Please give a warm welcome to all of these individuals. And I'm going to turn the phone over to Sebastian Heinz of Zenith Aircraft, who is now also the owner of SAM Aircraft, an interesting new development. Sebastian has done these kinds of engine debates at his uh, annual open house and uh, had a great response and kudos to Robert Helm who brought this idea to the forefront. So thank you for that, Robert. I hope you'll enjoy this discussion. I've been cracking the whip over Sebastian's head to keep it lively, to keep it fast. Here's how it's going to work. Each manufacturer will be given three minutes to make some comments about their engines. And then Sebastian has a series of questions which they've all received in advance so they know at least some of the questions that he's going to ask him. He may throw a curve here or there, so pay attention. And I'll now turn it over to Sebastian. Thank you, Sebastian, for being here to do the moderating job. I hope you folks all enjoy it. When this is concluded, thank you for coming. I'll have some more remarks at the end. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, a number of years ago, we started doing this uh, engine, engine panel discussion, uh, like Dan mentioned, at the Zenith uh, Open Hangar Day. Uh, we're one of the few kit manufacturers out there that really encourages uh, our individual builders to to look at all the engine choices out there because we do have quite a few engine choices and uh, as we all know in any industry we, we need we need choices we need competition because that's how we get innovation and uh, new products and so forth so uh, we've always encouraged that uh, and, and it, one of the nice things in the experimental realm is that we builders do have that choice which engine to install in their airplane of course, they have that freedom, and with that, with that freedom comes responsibility. We want to choose the best engine for our individual needs. And uh, of course, uh, as we've seen, there are a lot of great engines out there on the market, and uh, it's it becomes our decision or our, our, our uh, responsibility to find the one that works best for our mission. And every every builder has going to have a slightly different mission uh, for their aircraft, and so it's uh, it's always been my pleasure over the years to develop a good working relationship with all, all of these gentlemen up here because uh, we, we put a lot of these in Zenith airplanes and we, we, we continue to work uh, with them. So I'm going to start here with Christian, he's right next to me, and uh, give you about three minutes to discuss about what Rotax, who Rotax is and of course what Rotax is all about and then we'll move, it, we'll move on down the line. Okay, so I joined Rotax in uh, 2007, which was the year uh, when I turned my hobby into a uh, profession and I uh, can really say that I'm living my dream of flying now and I fly a lot. So the last two years I flew 100 hours per year across Europe uh, in order to promote our 925 Sport engine and it's always nice to print uh, brochures with engine data but it's better, I think in my opinion, more efficient to provide demo flights to OEMs to convince them and after 20 seconds taking off with the high sport all were convinced and so far we, as of today, we collected 61 912 high sport projects completed design ins and further 31 in progress. So up to now customers can select 92 aircraft types with the 912 high sport engine. And I think the recently announced 959 s engine will help to trigger more conversions towards injection technology. So all this OPEC success story started 40 years ago, exactly here in the United States, when the first passionate enthusiasts started to use OPEC uh, Skido engines for their home-built experimental planes. And thanks to those enthusiasts, uh, which made OTOX joining or stepping into this aviation business. And now we're celebrating 40 years OTOX, and you can read the, the numbers in the back on the roll-up. So we sold more than 175,000 aircraft engines, and uh, only our first work fleet alone collected 45 millions of flight hours. And the good thing is 
that we add 5 million flight hours every year on top of this. So 20 distributors worldwide selling around 4,000 aircraft engines worldwide, either directly or via their independent service centers or their independent uh, repair centers. And more than 200 OEMs or aircraft manufacturers worldwide are using Rotax now. And our network is taking care of all the 40,000 flying engines around the globe. And I want to say thank you to the Rotax Flying and Safety Club, to Eric Tucker for training 2,000 IRMPs, which means Independent Rotax Maintenance Technician, which is a worldwide standardized training with service, um, line maintenance, heavy maintenance, and overhaul courses. And I also want to thank uh, Dan and the uh, Board of Directors of LAMA for electing me to this board in 2009 already. It was a big honor for me, and uh, I promise that I will support the interest of LAMA and the members as much as I can. And finally, I, I want to ask you to go out and talk about the passion of flying, provide demo rights to as many people as possible, the more we spread the passion of flying, the more we can increase the sales of aircraft and engines. Please uh, visit our website, flyrotox.com. All right, thank you, Christian. And uh, I must be getting old because I remember when Ropax was still a newcomer in the aircraft engine business. And of course, uh, you know, Ropax has, has done phenomenally well in this space. And, uh, and again, um, and I, you know, I remember with my dad uh, back in, I think it was uh, 1990 or 1991, with the, with the brand new Ropax 912, which was a you know a brand new engine, we were one of the first ones to put it in a 601, and I remember flying with it. And uh, and again, now it's become really the standard for light sport aircraft. So it's really nice to see to see that kind of uh, innovation. Well, next we have John and and you know Continental Motors. We all know Continental from from years ago, and uh, John's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the, the new things at Continental. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, my name is John Heitland. I'm sales manager for Continental Motors. I've uh, been with the company about three years, started as a tech rep, an uh, AMP, and a pilot for those guys. So uh, thank you for letting us uh, come out here to this. Uh, again, a lot of you guys know Continental from you know being in the business in the certified world since 1905, I believe. Uh, but in, in recent times, with the O200 recently, uh, we've been able to uh, uh, get our engine on a lot of the airframes that we typically hadn't had the opportunity to because of uh, certification issues and whatnot. But uh, along with the O200, we've also uh, recently, last year, about Oshkosh time, we picked up the Titan line of, of uh, LS, or, uh, PMA uh, Lycoming parts, but also their Titan engines, which I'm really excited about. We have JB sitting over there uh, representing the Titan line today. Um, we're super excited about adding those guys on. It gives us another element, uh, another tool in our toolbox to be able to go out and sell a product to, to customers uh, worldwide and have the backing of Continental uh, with our marketing and our engineering support that we can provide a, an experimental engine uh, product. So, uh, you know, that basically the engine that we are, are most excited about is the. Uh, the OX340, it's a, it's a 320 type base, the Lycoming 320 base is a product that we've stroked that engine out to, to roughly 180 horses continuous. Uh, it only weighs a dressed out about 245, 250 pounds depending on how you uh, equip it. But again, the, what we try to do is, is allow the customer to pick and choose as many options on that engine as they possibly can. So it's a pretty much a customized two order engine um, and fully dressed out with dual ignition. Uh, magnesium something like now you're looking probably 28,000 out the door roughly so but again thank you uh, for allowing uh, I'm going to be here myself and Dan thank you for the opportunity to talk today thank you all right thank you John and uh, next up we have Pete uh, from uh, Jabiru Engines and uh, Pete's has quite a long history with with the Jabiru Engines and with the Jabiru airplanes and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about Jabiru Pete thanks Sebastian um, Jabber Aircraft started in Australia in 1988, with Australia having uh, recently passed what they call their ultralight rule, which is somewhat similar to our light sport rule here, where a pilot could fly an airplane with limited weight, limited speed, with uh, reduced training requirements, and no medical, they could be a farm. So uh, Rod Stiff and Phil Ainsworth, both pilots, um, quit their jobs and uh, Rod had the idea for what he called a small plastic airplane. So in Australia, 
to get that airplane certified, even as an ultra light, is uh, quite a daunting task. Took them three years. So in 1991, the first Jabiru airplane flew, but not with a Jabiru engine. Um, after they got certified by the Australian authorities, the engine manufacturer they were using, 30 days later, uh, notified them they were going out of the aircraft engine production business. So Rod, being a pretty brave guy, said, I'll build my own bloody engine, mate. <laughs> 11 months later, the first Jabiru engine flew. That was in 1992. Uh, since then, Jabiru has uh, continued to develop the engine uh, from the original 1600cc to 2200 and now 3300. And for a while, they had an eight-cylinder 5100cc uh, engine. To date, we've sold, uh, produced and sold about 7,000 engines. Um, I started with Jabiru back in 1999, and for the last number of years, I've been the sole North American distributor of Jabiru aircraft and engines. Um, the airplane itself, there's. Uh, 2,800 of them flying around the world. Um, in the USA, probably about 350. The Jabiru philosophy is a little bit different, I think. Uh, maybe it's the uh, Aussie way or whatever, but uh, Jabiru's philosophy and how they operate their company, design their products, is based on four basic principles. Number one, what they develop in the Reliable, number two, it needs to be simple. Uh, number three, it needs to be economical. Uh, and if you knew the owner of Jabiru, economical means really squeezing that penny. And finally, the technology used needs to be available. And when Rod says available, he means available in Russia, China, Africa, where a lot of the technology for, for instance, fuel injection is not well known. So uh, with that uh, philosophy, Jabiru's engines are carbureted, and the plan is to continue to uh, produce them as carbureted engines, but to make as many other improvements as they can, like uh, roller cam followers and uh, you know, hydraulic lifters, internal oiling systems. Uh, it's a continual evolving process with Jabiru. Thank you, Pete. Uh, next up, next up uh, we have Robert Helms with UL Power. Uh, UL Power is the relative newcomer here among, uh, I think, the group here. Um, and uh, at Zenith, we, we've, all, we've always encouraged new engine developments. It's one of the things we like to see. And uh, for example, I flew down here in our, in our new Zenith uh, CH750 Stoll uh, Cruiser powered by the, the UL350 IS. Uh, happy to say it was a very uneventful event. Uh, good flight down, and, and uh, so anyway, uh, let's let's hear from Robert about the UL power engine. And, and I followed him with a truck full of parts. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if I'm elected as your engine of choice, I think the first thing we need to do is build a wall. <laughs> and this wall is to keep out any new engine companies. <laughs> I think everybody here will agree with that. We'll call this a firewall or something like that. <laughs> I believe also it's important to reach across the aisle. So if you've got in your airplane a Rotax or a Continental or a Jabiru or a Viking, I'll help you. We'll reach across the aisle and rip that engine out and we'll put you all power in it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, we're a real conservative but yet liberal company. Uh, <laughs> we're, uh, we're priced on the uh, liberal side. <laughs> but. Uh, we're, we're conservative on weight. We've got eight engines, and uh, we're probably some of the lightest engines. We have 97 horsepower up to 200 horsepower, and 97 horsepower at 107 or 160 pounds, and then at the high end of 200 horsepower, 242 pounds. So we're pretty pretty good there. And we believe in freedom of choice. So when it comes to fuel, you can use whatever you want. You can use automotive fuel, you can use uh, ab gas, and you can use ethanol. And ethanol. You know, some of my some of my counterparts here believe ethanol is the way to go, but we think we should stop the ethanol and stick to gasoline. So, if you elect us, then you can use ethanol, but we'd rather you didn't. Uh, ethanol is really 
Ethanol is tough on the airplane. It's tough on the tanks. It's tough on the lines. Um, we can use up to 15% ethanol in our engines, but it's really not good. So if you can avoid it, avoid it. And uh, we have two different compression level engines. Some engines can use 91 octane, some are 93 octane. And all of our engines can use 100 low lead. But if you do, we really want you to use to do something about the lead. So you can use uh, Decalin or TCP. And some people are using Marvel Mister Oil to help clean out the, the lead. And if you're on a cross-country flight, you normally use automotive gas. You can use 100 low lead. And then when you get home, you can switch back to automotive gas. All of our engines are direct drive, air-cooled. Um, horizontally opposed engines. Um, almost all of the components are designed by UL Power and manufactured by UL Power. The crankshaft is our design, but it's manufactured by somebody else. We buy the pistons. And then whenever we can get components that are available to keep the cost down, we have uh, Bosch injectors. We've got alternator off of a Harley and the starters off of BMW. So it helps keep the cost down and it's good quality components, and so we're able to do that. Wake's Aircraft Supply has all of our parts in the United States. They're open six days a week, so you can get all your spare parts and things there. Some parts you can get at the local auto parts store, like oil filters and spark plugs and injectors, things like that. So we wanted it to be a, a good engine of choice. You know, it's uh, easy to install, it's easy to maintain, and it's single lever operation. You know, crack the throttle, turn the key, and go. There's no primer, no choke, no carburetor heat, no mixture. So uh, we got an engine here in the booth if anybody wants to see an engine. And if you have any questions, we'll be here. We'll be here all week. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Uh, next up, we have Jan Eggenfelder. Uh, Jan is, is, I consider, the alternative uh, person. Uh, we've got the conservative and the liberal over here. <laughs> he's right, and he's uh, maybe the alternative party. But uh, um, and, and Jan will talk about his Viking aircraft engine. So please welcome Jan. Thank you. Well, first off, um, I'm not sure, but I think, you know, so that you know that I'm not a good talker, I'm the designer of our engine, so I'm not the salesperson. I think I think everyone else here has, like, lots of departments, and they're the sale department. We don't have all those departments. We're very small. We don't build our own engine. We um, use a mass-produced Honda engine. So... Right off the bat, people know that our engine has good quality because we don't, you know, we don't have to push that the Honda engine is not world class because it is. Now, the other thing that we do, we don't necessarily believe that we have to kind of slow down on progress to have availability of parts throughout the world because none of the automotive manufacturers do that. Just like Robert says, you know, having parts that are available all over the place. Is, is commonplace with automotive technology. So, so we're actually, you know, always looking for the latest in technology. And right now our engines are the only engines, aircraft engines in the world, that use gasoline direct injection, which uses 2,200 pounds like a diesel engine to take the um, gasoline engine and make it one step better. And, and in many, many ways, like, there's no possibility of detonation. There's a lot more power to weight, uh, instant starting, very, very efficient running, all this kind of stuff. Like we always feel like everyone else is kind of like a little bit behind. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's not because we're so smart. It's because we just use technology that's always available in the automotive industry. You know, so we're, we're proud now. We have a, a 1.5 liter engine, but it puts out 130 horsepower, and we have more thrust out of that engine than, a, than an 0360, which, you know, that's a big engine. But having a light sport engine that puts that kind of power to the propeller is, is important to us. So that's Viking, and, and the reason for the Viking name is just because I grew up in Viking land. I grew up in Norway. So. All right, thank you. Now, the, the, the five uh, last speakers, those were basically gasoline engines. And I, and I think nowadays we really can't have a, an honest discussion about aircraft power systems without speaking a little bit about electric. Uh, a few years ago, we, you know, I think the interest uh, level really peaked in electric, and it's kind of kind of come back the last few years, I think, uh, you know, as we see that there are still challenges, real challenges, to, to you know, before it's readily available. But it's definitely a technology that a lot of us uh, manufacturers are already looking at, and I know many consumers are talking about and, and asking questions about. 
And uh, today we have a, uh, we're, ha we're glad to have uh, Willy Taki uh, from uh, Germany uh, come out and, and speak a little bit about the, the progress that we're seeing in electric power. Europeans seem to be a little bit ahead of the curve when it comes to alternative power, uh, primarily I think because of the, the higher prices, uh, that's where we see uh, you know, the road tax fuel efficiency and so forth because uh, we're just, uh, they're faced with much higher fuel prices. And electric is going to be no different, uh, and as well as environmental concerns. So if we can have a little update from Willie, please. Yeah. In contrast to all the other people speaking here, I'm not a manufacturer, so I don't have to sell anything. But I think still I want to sell the idea that electric is one of the future technology of propulsion systems. So when I heard that Dan and uh, Sebastian are putting up this talk here, I called them and said, I think electric should be on there because I, my position is I organized the electric flight exhibition in, at Aero in Friedrichshafen, Germany over the, since 2009. And the background was I was visiting uh, a company in China and flying an air, electric aircraft up there, the E-Spider, which was a nice little electric aircraft based on an ultralight and it was sold to me, the idea. And I think this is future and this last year uh, we have had a lot of different points which made acceleration in this. One is for example at the beginning of the year Siemens announced that they will they do have a business model they have about a hundred engineers working in development technologies and about three years ago they were talking and said yeah we just look at the certified sector now they say, okay, we have to look at all the scheme, to at experimental, at uh, home build, uh, which is the same, at uh, LSA and at, at ultralight engines. And uh, then you all heard about uh, what Airbus was announcing, a little two-seat aircraft LSA category with uh, electric motor. And uh, apart from this, we have at this time the uh, solar impulse flying around the world on electric energy and I can tell you really the interest was never as high as this. This year we had at, at the Aero the visit of the European Commissioner of Transport which is the highest institution, institution at the European community and from all the time she spent it half a day at the show she did spend uh, about 80% on electric and the rest on divided on, on several other companies. And they, I have been last month in China, and uh, not the whole month, but I was the month in there, and we, there was a convention organized by different universities which are working on uh, uh, electric aviation. And they, their goal is in about 30, 40 years having electric airliners, half uh, um, which hybrid powered electric airliners. And uh, they said, if we want this in 30 years, we have to start with small two-place aircraft right now. And there are several countries, like in the European Union, also in China, which can use government funding for developing this kind of uh, aircraft and this kind of uh, engines or propulsion systems. In a part, it will be perhaps hybrid solutions. And some of you will ask, yeah, but if you still have the combustion engine on board, why not taking a combustion engine right away? But there are several advantages, for example, in design capacity, of redesigning the aircraft in a total different way than you have to do it when you have a big engine which you put in front of the aircraft. And um, the interesting thing what was what happened after Oshkosh this year, I talked several times with the people of Gamma. And you all know Gamma, the big Gamma General Aviation Manufacturers Association, which didn't want to get involved with ultralight, didn't want to get involved with LSA. And now they see electric is coming, they see the demand is coming. And we talked about, and they accept now that they say, okay, we will make a special group and they will accept everybody who's working in electric because we have to push the rules getting made. Because I talked with people at EASA, at FAA, or at the associations like in Germany, which do certification there. And they said, okay, um, we don't know how to do it. We don't know how to use 200, 400 voltage inside a cockpit because there is a danger of this high voltage. So 
These are things which have to be developed. There are a lot of challenges, but there are a lot of people working on it. And I think if you are interested now, what you could do, ask more questions or taking the time in April between 19th and 24th, uh, there will be the Aero with the E-Flight Expo. And just one highlight which we will have there, for example, will be, perhaps you heard about this volocopter, vertical flying multi-copter manned, and it will fly at the Aero Show. So I think uh, there is enough interesting things to talk about. I no, I'm flying myself, still with combustion engines right now, but I think the future will be some kind of combination or perhaps purely electric fly. Thank you, Willie. <laughs> yeah, real quick. A real quick procedural point, Sebastian. Under the Constitution, my engine may not have been born in the United States, but my mom is a citizen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. But uh, well, back to, back to Willie's point, or a serious point here a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I think electric is has a lot of us, you know, intrigued. We're, we're kind of fascinated by it. Um, I think, uh, like Willie mentioned, there are still some real challenges uh, to it. And, uh, you know, for us, U.S., especially the U.S. manufacturers, you know, we, we still are in many ways the leaders in, in light air aviation. And uh, that said, we're also entrenched with old technology in many ways. And uh, electric, when we see the Chinese involvement with electric and so forth, they're, you know, they're, they're basically have the potential to leapfrog us uh, in technology, and we have to be careful there. Uh, on, on the flip side, uh, back to our side, is you know, with record low oil prices, and it seems every day is new, new lows in it, is that you know, we, we, we're not in a rush to find a cheaper alternative uh, uh, to fuel because we have abundant supplies. So it's, and the U.S. has always been blessed by having relatively uh, inexpensive gas. So, and uh, so it, it, it's going to be a real challenge, of, I think, interesting for all of us to, to see the future developments. Uh, as we see, you know, this whole drone industry virgin, and that's really built on electric technology. And uh, we're going to see that more and more so. And these drones are getting bigger. You know, before they were just little RC things. Now, you know, they're, they're main drones and, and things like that. It's, it's going to be real interesting in the, in the coming years. Uh, since we're talking about fuel and, and so forth, let's, let, let me lead on with the net first question about fuel. Uh, uh, I know that's always a, 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 a popular uh, a question of discussion. Uh, so I'm going to ask, uh, and then we'll just go through through each of you. Is uh, what fuel type uh, is approved for your engine, and uh, and if you can do a quick add-on about ethanol. I think Robert addressed ethanol very very briefly already, but uh, you know what what fuel types uh, currently and and in the near future, as well as uh, your position on ethanol. Go ahead, Christian. Okay, to make it quite quick, uh, Afgas, Mogas, and uh, E10 is allowed. So. Very simple. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so when you say E10, uh, what, what is that? 10% uh, ethanol. 10% ethanol. So we even proved it higher, but um, doesn't it also worked with 22%, but officially we allowed 10% ethanol. And uh, I think somebody mentioned it, the challenges on the OEM side, fuel lines and tanks and so on, not so, on the engine. So the, the Ropax engine is well suited for up to E10, but then the the, the manufacturer still needs to to approve, I guess, the uh, the airframe side with the fuel lines and so forth. Is that good? Okay. Okay. Thank you. You know, on, on the continental side, it's, a lot of these questions will probably get answered by it depends. Um, on our continental uh, certified side, it's going to be 100 low lead. Um, no ethanol. Um, on the experimental side, we have been uh, flirting around and we do advertise down to 93, no ethanol. Um, so basically that's where we're at. And obviously we have the, the diesel development, so that's all um, jet A and any, any certified equivalent over in Europe. Yeah, and I mentioned to, the, to discuss that a little bit earlier, uh, there are some interesting diesel developments being made. Uh, Continental is one of the leaders behind that. And there was also a, a new company, well, Superior Aircraft Engine had acquired a, a British two-cycle diesel company. We were hoping they'd be able to be here, but they, they just weren't participating here at the Sebring uh, LSA Expo. And I'm not sure what that's indicative of, if they're, if they're having running into delays in, in their product development or not. And I, I can't really comment on that, but they weren't able to be here. But that's definitely another alternative uh, fuel source. Uh, and again, Continental is one of those companies behind that quite a bit. Uh, Pete, did you want to discuss uh, quickly the fuel? Sure. Uh, General currently approves under low lead or auto fuel of uh, 
95 R O N or better, which equates in the USA to about a 91 anti knock index that you see on a pump, and up to 10% ethanol. But the, the concern that Jaguar has about ethanol is uh, a lot of airplanes uh, sometimes uh, sit quite a while between flights, and ethanol has the tendency to absorb some moisture from the air. Begins to settle, and there is a bacteria that grows in there, feeds on the hydrocarbons in the fuel, and produces a sticky, slimy, mucus like deposit, which we have seen in a number of cases to gum up carburetors, fuel filters, and so forth. So, with that caution, the engines run on it fine, but the management of the ethanol is probably more important uh, than, than anything else in running ethanol. Robert? I already answered, so go ahead. Uh, very similar uh, answer. You, you do want, 100 low lead is fine. Um, if you want to put some marble mixture oil in, that's good too. It, it does keep the plugs cleaner longer. Um, the testing of the engine is all done on 87, the, the lowest grade we can buy here in the U.S. with 10% ethanol, and that's because we want to tune the engine for worst case scenario. Now, that doesn't mean that I run my engine after it's tuned and ready to go on the cheapest gas that I can get. I don't, but I go up to a mid-grade gas. And part of that is because of what Pete was saying, that gasoline, car gas goes bad. It just, and then even the octane drops from sitting. And um, Hunter Lola is far superior. I mean, it's a great fuel. You, you, you put it in a bucket, you leave it for 10 years, it's just as good. It, it's an amazingly nice fuel. So, you know, if you want to keep everything clean, the tanks clean, the, the, the you know, the components in the engine clean, 100 low light. Uh, if you want to use car gas, 92 or whatever it is, and up. And if you're about to park the airplane to leave it for a while, put some 100 low light in either one tank or the other and run it through to keep the injectors and filters and everything nice when you go on vacation. And, uh, uh -oh. yeah, let's, let's hear, uh, uh, you know, like, an answer. look at that. <laughs> like, uh, different type of fuel. We'll talk about yeah. batteries quickly, if you don't mind. I, I think the, the, the question is, because most, a lot of solutions are right now uh, hybrid solutions for the beginning. And the advantage, if you have this kind of hybrid solution, that you're relatively easy, may change for a jet fuel, diesel, or gasoline engine. Uh, which is very interesting for different countries. Like in China, there is no 100 LL distribution. There is, uh, there is also no good fuel distribution in diesel, but there is a Jet A distribution for the airliners and helicopters and stuff like this. So this is something which also is an advantage if you work on this hybrid thing that you more easily can exchange the, the, the uh, range extender range. How come the electric guy had the longest answer? <laughs> I have to explain everything. <laughs> One really quick thing, because this is for everybody. We put some diesel fuel into the gasoline direct injected engine just to see if it would start. It ran great, <laughs> but don't don't do it because you can't. It, it doesn't have any octane. It, it'll detonate, but at idle, it'll run beautiful. <laughs> That's one of the things experimental people do, is we just try things out just to see what will happen sometime, right? False promises. Hold my beer and watch this. <laughs> now, uh, one of the nice things about uh, the Sebring uh, Sport Aviation Expo, it's at the very beginning of the year. We, a lot of companies take the opportunity to uh, announce new products or, or get ready for the new year. Uh, if we can quickly go through, through our group and talk about the new things we're, we're currently developing, currently working on. Uh, of course, I know some of you don't want to go public with things that aren't ready quite for, for public, but if you can share with, uh, with all of us uh, what, we, what we should be expecting from you in this coming year. Yeah, okay, the Optox 915 IS with 100 kilowatt, 135 HP was announced in Oscar last year, and uh, we will be ready to start mass production in the second half of uh, 2017. Uh, but. Uh, we are looking for OEMs who want to participate in the fleet testing, which we will start with P3 prototype engine this year in August. So we, we are aiming for 20 OEMs to participate in this testing. So, and uh, I'm also 
authorized to say that this engine will not be the last one. Good, good. And, and the, pro the, the program is, is advancing as planned on the 915? The, the 915IS is a basis on the 912i Sport with uh, enhanced crankshaft, uh, with new gearbox and forge piston and, and um, oil injection from the bottom of the piston. Uh, with the intercooler and a bigger turbo with a compression ratio 1 to 4.5 and the, the gearbox will be 1 to 2.54 which means we reduce the maximum RPM of the prop from 2400 to 2300. Was this the question? No, but that's good. <laughs> but, uh, no, but I was just asking the progress of the development on the engine. Is, is the progress coming along on schedule? Yeah, yeah, so we will not do the same as in the past on the 936. To, Come up with a big catching from school, from small, so we do small steps. Mm -hmm. Well, good, thank you, John. Again, on the on the continental side, the, the diesel production we're we're moving from the CD 135 155 that we've been developing from the old Tealer design. Um, hopefully this year in Oshkosh will probably be this plane a 3.0, which will be hopefully a 300 horse version. It doesn't really apply to a lot of us here, but it's on our certified side, and then on the the Titan side, we're looking at certifying ASTM on the 371, and we're also uh, building, currently building the, the Iowa 540. So any of the guys looking for a, a big 540, we produce that as well. And any uh, any new development on the O200D? It's it's pretty much remaining, you know, true to course right now. It's, I don't think R and D is, is progressing along much. I think it's we're just going to see how the, the market bears on the O200. And, and I know the guys are looking at maybe a lighter, um, smaller horsepower, but that's not anything I even know about, but I know there has been talk that the, the guys are working on. All right, thank you. Pete? 2016 will be an exciting year for Jabiru, coming out with two new engines. A, they call it a 2210, which is a 2200cc, same as we have now, and a 3310. These engines will have cast aluminum heads and cast aluminum cylinders with a 90 cell type process to um, harden the, uh, the bores. Um, new induction configurations and uh, some other options for carburation. So it'll be an exciting year. We'll have the 2210 on display at uh, Sun and Fun. We were aiming to have it here, but they didn't quite make it. And the 3310, um, I think, hopefully, at Oshkosh, uh, on the front of, a, uh, in front of an airplane that my uh, grandson and I are building. Thank you. Yeah, interesting. Robert? We have a new warranty program. We're going to call it Obamacare. <laughs> and uh, there's no pre existing condition limitation, so. If you get an engine that has a problem, we'll still fix it. <laughs> no, what's exciting for us is the engines aren't changing, but we've got a lot of new airplanes coming up. The six-cylinder especially is very light for the thrust, so we've got some, some OEM companies and some individual builders. We've got a long, easy flying with 160 horsepower, the just aircraft with the super stall stretch with the 180 horsepower, now they're doing a 200 horsepower. There's a Rans S7 flying with 160 horsepower and an S20 coming with 180 horsepower. A Zenith 750 with 160 horsepower. Uh, uh, remember the uh, the Dragonfly. The Dragonfly is going to put 130 horsepower on it. So it's, we're having fun with the engines in new airplane applications. It's a lot of fun. And yeah, uh, we'll introduce the um, 170 horsepower um, at Sun Fun. Uh, that is again a an existing engine that Honda came out with. It's in the 2016 Honda Civic. The Civic comes with two engines this year. It's a two liter engine or a 1.5 engine, which is the one that we're using now ex as far as size, except this is a engine built from the ground up to be Honda's first turbocharged engine. Okay, so it's gasoline direct injection. It's turbocharged. It has variable valve timing, uh, variable valve lift. Some people say, why well, we need all that in an airplane? Well, you'll, you'll see when you fly an engine that has that stuff. It's really, really phenomenal as far as economy and power. So the, the engine is built by Honda to be a 170 horsepower engine. The crankshaft is set up for a turbo engine. The, the, the connecting rods are set up for the entire engine is designed to be turbocharged. It is not an engine 
that is just an automotive engine that now has a turbocharger on it. It is, it is designed that way. In fact, the torque curve is uh, phenomenal. It's like time and a half what any other light sport engine. Um, huge torque. But the most remarkable thing is that torque curve, it's not even a torque, a curve. It is a flat line. It has the same torque from 1900 RPM all the way to 5400 RPM. It, it's going to be an amazing engine. Anybody has a Honda in the parking lot, you might want to leave now while John's on the stage. <laughs> all right, well, I want to thank all of you so much for uh, spending the time to, to talk about uh, your engines. Uh, I, I agree, I think 2016 is going to be an exciting year. Got a lot, lot going on, and uh, again, I want to thank all of you individually and uh, for coming out and sharing the information. And, and all of you out there, I know uh, these guys all want to talk to you, so, so come out and visit them. Talk to the to talk to them about their engine developments, how they could fit on your airframe, and and how they could benefit uh, your customers uh, with these engines. So again, I, I want to thank all of you guys for coming out, and spending some time, and, and thank all of you in the audience for for listening, and thanks for uh, Dan for organizing this. Thank you. Dan. Well, I appreciate all of you uh, being here for this. Uh, I'd like to hear. Uh, I want to get a sense of what you think of this because we have some. Uh, big plans to do more of this at Sun and Fun, not just with engines, but with some other products. So this was kind of a beta test. Uh, give me a, give me some applause if you like the concept of what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, one thing we didn't do, I'd like to ask each of the manufacturers that are up here uh, to tell me where you're at on the field so everybody can find you real well. Uh, Christian? Yeah, the water tank is just over there. Uh, <laughs> right in front of the entrance almost. We're in the main display tent. Uh, go through the main doors and hang on right and you'll see us two boost down. Okay, that would be, uh, let's see, that's east for some of us. <laughs> okay. Pete? Uh, Jeffrey is outdoors in uh, lot number 15, just around the corner from uh, Flight Design CT. And, uh, We're inside the tent right across from Continental. Uh, Viking is behind us, walking towards the FBO um, by the flight line there. And hey, Willie, you have a, a space here as well where you can find out more about his publications and many other things. Yeah, like if you have more questions on electric, we're in the tent. Uh, it's, uh, I think, T107 uh, or 105. So walk in the entrance and turn to the left or the west. <laughs> you go along. Okay. Okay, uh, one last, couple of last things here. Also, a thank you, a special thank you to Z and Sebastian, uh, you're located out in front of the tent here. We appreciate everybody doing this. Uh, I'd like to make a mention that, uh, again, all of this is put on for you here thanks to the sponsorship of Aviator Hotline. We appreciate that. We appreciate Spencer Aircraft and their support. A very warm thank you to the Flying Musicians Association, who not only play for you during the week, but helped us with all the microphones. And believe me, that's over my pay grade. So thanks to the Flying Musicians Association for that. And finally, last but not least, don't forget to join Lama. Remember, this company, this organization is the only one looking out for the light aircraft segment. We're pleased with the support of Gamma, as Willie mentioned, and all the other alphabet organizations that we talked to, but all of them have other things on their plate ahead of us. So please join Lama. You can get more information at lama.bz.